Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I think we opened a huge topic here, and I'll welcome questions uh, very much after the introductory. Um, as you heard from Kim Kanjang Nim's kind introductory, uh, I'm kind of a hybrid. Not like a Toyota Prius or a Hyundai Avante. It's a different hybrid. Being born in the West, entering the Dharma, becoming a monk in the Orient, training here, then going back, making a Korean temple, then uh, always coming and going between East and West, it might confuse anybody's identity. Or it can help you make it clear that you are neither Westerner nor Oriental. In the West, there are many ways to approach this notion of self. And oddly enough, and paradoxically enough, the notion of self is the kind of least defined concept in human history just because we have so many versions of it. If you look at the last 2,300, 2,500 years, how many ideas did we have of who we are as a person, as an individual, and who we are as a species, human beings. If you look at the, optimistically speaking, evolution of our species, uh, the change in these notions, who we are, what we are, is so tremendous that you cannot really rely on them more than a couple of decades or maybe a couple of centuries. However, we've had oriental approaches to this notion that rather had questions than fixed or premeditated answers. And that's when East and West started to really differ from one another in the last two and a half millennia. So in the West, we have a lot of definitions, a lot of philosophy, and these days a lot of therapy to fix the notion of self. In fact, in the West, we want to make the self longer, living longer, we want to make the self stronger, that your ego would sustain all kinds of uh, shocks and conflicts. We want to make it uh, more efficient. That means uh, we want to be faster, quicker, do things cheaper, things like that, with less energy. So that's corresponding to the Western notion of self, which is a solid entity. Like the Greeks in the old days, they discovered the atom, Democritus, if you remember from your studies. Over 2,000 years ago, he discovered that this is actually not a solid thing. If you look at it, it consists of atoms and some space between them. He believed the atom is solid. And for almost 2,000 years, he was right. Then came quantum physics, and we started to discover that the atom also consists of smaller particles. In fact, only we see it as particles. These days it would be more proper to say they are little chunks of energy which are slightly denser than the space around them. Likewise, we had the notion of self, the ego, as a solid entity for a very, very long time. Something which is not really changeable. You can change its habits, you can change its uh, characteristics, but it's not something that you can change. In other words, you are determined by some higher being in the West, usually God, who created you into the form and into the shape and into the habits of who you think you are. And that's the self, like the atom, that you cannot change. And therapy wants to fix that, because this self is imperfect, this self has problems, this self, this self has dualistic notions, it has a lot of things that we don't want in it, and we are missing a lot of things. We are missing perfection, we are missing happiness, we want all kinds of stuff that we don't seem to have. So that's our ego problem as well. In the old days, there was a great teacher, and he said, ego sum via veritas et vita. If you speak Latin, this means I am the way, the truth, and life. And this begins with ego. Now, can we believe that this ego is actually us? Can you truthfully say that, really, I am the way, truth, and life? So what is the difference between your notion of self, yourself, 
And Jesus is teaching on ego, on the I. What did he really mean by that? So what is really the way, the truth, and life? And most importantly, what is the I before all of that? In the West, we don't really question that. That's why we have so many definitions, so many philosophies, and so much science more recently around the notion of self. But we don't question the basics. We have our material science underpinning this with the atomistic theory, and it doesn't matter that it kind of blew up into various other physics, like quantum physics or string theory or this huge astrophysics that they've got these days. Our notion of self really has not changed in the West. Then came our interaction with the Orient, where we have a lot of questions. Where the Buddha said, don't believe what I say just because it's logical or it's handed down by the elders or by a credible line of tradition. Do not believe it. Investigate it. Try it for yourself. And if it seems to work, then grow up to it. So he had the benefit of the doubt, even in his own teaching, just for all of us. And most importantly, in our Son Bulgyo, Korean Son, we are encouraged to ask this question, what am I? Or what is this self? And because of that, you can discover what you are. You can find your internal teacher. You can actually attain your true self. And what's really paradoxical, you'll meet a lot of paradoxes, but one of the major paradoxes is that you cannot grasp it with your hand. You cannot put it into a form. You cannot say it with a single name. Yet, yet, it exists and it works. Otherwise, how would you be born? What is it that would make you aware? What is it that would say inside of you, I? What would see? What would hear? What would remember? What would think? What would judge? What would that be? Yet, you cannot find it just by grasping an object. And you cannot attain it just by thinking something. The old Chinese wisdom used to say, how could you find an ox on which you are already sitting? And that's why you need an external teacher. Even the Buddha had teachers. He had a couple of recluses or hermits from whom he started to learn. But he found their teaching insufficient. Although they were pretty high class in their own time, the Buddha moved on. And I think it is very difficult for anybody in a human body on this earth to start without a foreign teacher or an external teacher. So that's why we talk about the treasure of the Buddha. The treasure of the Buddha is not an idea, it's the role of the teacher in your life. So, a teacher has two jobs. One is to offer you a clear direction. And if you choose to follow it, comes the second job, tell you when you are actually diverting from it. But in between the two, pointing out the correct direction and helping you keep it, there's one important step, your conscious choice and independent decision, that you actually want to follow that. If not, you have no karma with that teacher or teaching. That means that you don't do anything. You go next door, you find another person, and then you continue your search for the true path and your true self in some other way. So the first thing is really connect. And when you have connected, then that direction can start to help you. And if you don't have this external teacher, then this pointing out of the way, opening the Dharma, or showing some direction, doesn't happen. You continue to suffer, you continue to have questions, you continue to have crises. But do you have answers? Do you have some wisdom that you can distill from all these experiences? So that's why an external teacher is really important because it helps you identify or find your internal teacher, your true self. 
And that's the job of the external teacher, the form teacher, which he or she cannot fail to do. We call this spiritual independence. So that's the third step. You remember the first? Pointing out the direction. Second, really help you if you divert from it. And third, make you independent or spiritually grown up. And that means you find your teacher inside. By then, you don't think that it begins with I. It's not an ego. And if you attain that non-ego, then you truly can become the way, the truth, and correct life. That's why in Son Burgyo, in Son Buddhism, we say, ultimately, even a tree can teach you, or a dog can teach you, or the mountain can teach you. But for that, you have to attain your true self. For that, you have to become independent of your notion of I. So, when you look at Western therapy, they really try to fix you. Fix your emotions, fix your thinking. But they don't touch your notion of self. In the Orient, that's what you get first. You don't get any big medicine but they really touch your notion of ego. So who is this that came to the temple? Why do you want to practice the Dharma? Who do you think you are? That's the first question that you get from a teacher in one way or another. So these two trains are actually passing seemingly to opposite direction. That means taking away your eye or fixing your eye and making it even stronger. But, interestingly enough, these two trains are not going to opposite directions. In fact, they are following a circle. So don't think it's two linear sections, two long rails, and they never meet. Why? If you say that your eye exists as a solid entity, it's a mistake. If you say that your eye does not exist, that's also a mistake. So don't attach the words of the Buddha when he said, anatta, no I. Okay? What our job is as a human being is to find out and experience how we exist. How the notion of I comes around. And the Heart Sutra gives you a basic layout how it happens. It's like a good cookbook. The body, eyes, ears, nose, tongue, touch, and thinking. And you need a mind. Thinking is already mind. Then distinction is also mind. Memory is also mind. So in Korean, if you know the Paishik, and if you are from the West, you know the eight levels of consciousness, that is the ingredients. These are the ingredients you need to form a notion of self. Or from another aspect, the Heart Sutra talks about it, you need the five skandhas, the form, the body, feelings, perceptions, impulses, consciousness. If you have any of these missing, then your notion of self cannot come about, you cannot exist. Okay? So, the West describes it in so many ways. There is the first Vienna school, Freud and Jung, the second with Adler, the third with Frankl. All these things describe again and again what yourself is supposed to be. And all these descriptions are insufficient, imperfect, and impermanent. They give a partial job. Sometimes these partial jobs are really good, but they're not suitable for experiencing the generation, the creation of yourself moment to moment. Only meditation can do that. So when you meditate and you ask this question, what am I or what is this? You see these movies or images before your mind's eyes or your mind mirror. And you see how they form into ideas, thoughts, emotions, reflections, past, present and future. And that's how your I is born. And that's how your I also disappears and disassembles. 
So it's the generative notion of yourself, how you create it. Why it didn't come about in the West? Because there was somebody to create it for you. There was God to make the job, to do the job for you. And if there's something that creates you, you cannot experience your own creative aspect, your own creativity, your own creation of yourself. Okay? That's the fundamental difference in terms of looking at ourselves. But the ultimate lesson is the same. So sometimes you really need good descriptions and good methods for soothing yourself and treating your karma at the phenomenal level. And in that sense, therapy is good. Many people need it. But if you want to answer fundamental and deep questions, therapy is insufficient. Likewise, when you want to fix karma, sometimes your only question, what is this, is also insufficient. That's why I'm saying that these vehicles go in circles. They circumambulate one another. It's like this symbol of yin and yang or yin yon in Korean, you know? This big circle divided by this wave and two dots of opposing colors of black and white. So they actually go around one another. In fact, they need one another. Without that, the circle is not complete. But you should really know what you need. So we say you cannot teach Zen to people who are mentally ill. And it's true. Mentally ill people need therapy. Or mentally disturbed people need therapy. People who have a sick notion of self, they need therapy. People who have disturbed emotions, disturbed thinking, and a very unclear self, they also need therapy. But those who have the effort, who have the initiative, who have some kind of uh, functionality within themselves, they have no use for that because it would in fact make their ego stronger. Then they have to sit down and actually look into themselves where this notion of I comes from, where their emotions come from. And the best practice is when you can do both. When your external and the internal teacher become one, when you can learn from the world and learn from yourself at the same time. So I suggest that you use your question inside very wisely. In other words, do not just restrict the question to the absolute only. In other words, do not just ask, what am I? Or what is this? That's like zooming out to infinity. It's only the big question, the great question, the ultimate question. We call that kanhwasan, or perceive the path, perceive Zen. But you can use it with zooming in a little bit to any object of your mind. That means you can ask, where does my anger come from? That already has an object, anger. Or why do I feel like this towards a person? Why do I hate that person? Or why do I love somebody? How do I project my emotions onto somebody? So use this question to zoom in to certain problems and then soon you will not need somebody to tell you who you are, whether you are a good person or a bad person. In other words, you don't need an external creator to explain why the world is like this for you, why you exist like this. You become spiritually independent, self-reliant, but not lonely, not isolated, not separated from the world. In fact, and that's another paradox, the more reliant you are on your own spiritual practice, the more friends you have. Because people can trust you. People can depend on you. People can relate to you without the sense that you are clinging to them or they could cling to you. So independence makes a lot of friends for you. And dependence actually takes away so much. Even the object of your desire will be gone. Mm -hmm. completely gone. And when that happens, you know that you lost something. Just by being dependent, you lost something. The object of your desire, you lost completely. And you lost your friends. I used to teach uh, ex-drug addicts that just came out of their addiction. They were chemically clean, but mentally they were still addicted. Now that suffering, you don't want. They already went through hell, so they were in the purgatory of coming out to real life. For some it took three, four months, but they themselves felt it's insufficient. For some it took a year. 
And those who went through a year of rehab, they understood that uh, they went through something which will leave them completely changed, absolutely altered. So their notion of self got totally taken away, especially with LSD. But with other high controlled substances, I don't want to advertise anything. But the thing is, it will leave you completely altered. You will never be the same as before. And some people, in fact, want that and want to go through that. They hate themselves so much. So how could you do that without being addicted to a chemical substance? Well, the biggest addiction is to our dualistic views. The biggest addiction, which we don't even notice because everybody has it, is like uh, being attached to your own anger, desire, and ignorant views. In fact, that's why we are born. We can have also very noble tasks, very noble direction, but most of us, among seven billion people, we are dragged here by our own karma, which consists upon closer inspection of anger, desire, and ignorant views. Just like if you look at an atom, you find very, very small particles, the up quark, the down quark, and the charm quark, all of them, they're there. So they make up our matter. So what is it that makes up your karma? What are the primary impulses of your being? So this kind of addiction is extremely strong and that's what makes you born all the time. One life after one life after one life. And the Buddha's teaching is that this does not have to happen. You can become free. You can become free from this if you start to take some kind of medicine, and I really mean mind medicine. If you have therapy, sometimes the therapist describes some chemical medicine also for you, and you don't have to be you know, a psychiatric patient for that. And after a while, if the treatment is correct, if the therapy is correct, then you become independent. That means you no longer need that. And why some therapists in the West, especially in America, they want to have some meditation uh, built in? Because they see that they are walking in circles. So there used to be a joke that half of California goes to therapy and the other half is the therapist. And the reason is that it becomes really good. It becomes very intimate. In fact, it becomes so intimate that sometimes even marriages break up because the spouse spends more time with therapy than with family life, things like that. So it tries to somehow substitute something really deeply human for a lot of people, but originally it wasn't meant for that. It was meant to help you, to heal you, to somehow open your heart and open your mind. But therapy alone cannot do that, and those who recognize it, they try to do it with meditation. Now, then, when this combination, like, fusion food or combination pizza, when they come together, then people have to be extremely careful not to mistake one for another. Remember the trains or these two components going in circles? One can build up your ego and the other can break it down. Those who practice meditation, they can testify. Your notion of self can completely go away. And if you do it for the traditional three months, the ango, you will never think of yourself in the same way at the end as you used to at the beginning. That's a fact. So without any controlled substance, without any therapy, you can change yourself, but you should really know what you're doing. Nothing is more fundamental than that. So there's no bigger power in the material realm than nuclear power. So when you start to split atoms, huge energy can appear, and the same applies to yourself. When you split the notion of yourself, and you stop thinking of yourself as a solid, unchangeable entity, huge energy can appear, and then you have a responsibility. Ethical responsibility, moral responsibility, material, mental, all kinds of human responsibilities. Why? If you don't harness this energy, it becomes a nuclear bomb. You can hurt people. You can damage people.
You don't have the fixed notion of yourself, so it's very difficult to damage you, but you can still damage a lot of people. If you have this under the control of your great direction, of your bodhisattva path, then instead of a nuclear bomb, it becomes a nuclear reactor. Big difference, right? And then it starts to give out the energy of loving kindness, compassion, wisdom, and true selfless power. And that helps. So that's why it's very important to use the right medicine at the right time for the right person. And whether it starts as external or internal, it doesn't matter. What matters is, do you attain? Do you attain who you truly are? Do you really see the three marks of existence, impermanence, imperfection, and interdependence? So if you do that, then you can become what we call complete. And then the distinction of inside and outside can disappear. Then the circle can become empty. Then your mind functions clearly, moment to moment. Okay? Because empty ultimately means complete. And if you aspire, if you wish to attain anything, remotely, like the absolute or completeness, you have to become empty. There's no other way. Even if you have one little idea, one small notion of God, self, or whatever you purposefully think, that thought itself is your hindrance. That thought itself is the source of your fear and hope, life and death. And if you take that one last thought away, then your eye is gone. But you don't die. You don't go crazy. You don't go dysfunctional. You don't become an addict. Only your notion of I is gone. And I want to call, you know, as the, the end of the introductory, one great thought, um, which is called the Descartes bug fix. And that's done by a wonderful monk. And uh, I really wished to work with him for a long time. And he said, well, Descartes said, uh, I think therefore I am. But if you really look into that, you need to fix this little bug. So I think, therefore I think I am. And now next is a question. If you don't think, then what? So with this notion of little silence, I wish to end the introductory. And for your own sake, uh, turn it over to questions and answers. So, what I think is the most important point here is that any kind of medicine you use should not become the sickness itself. Repeat, if you use any kind of medicine, use it in such a way that it has the desired effect and makes itself unnecessary. And that's why this joke with California is so relevant because people become dependent on therapy and their former dependence or former addiction becomes different addiction and different dependence. What did we get? Not much. At least not the desired result. Okay? Or somebody was dependent on their depression or fear or anger or aggression, they start taking medicine and in six years they are still dependent on tranquilizers and these things. So, a really important point is the sickness becomes the medicine and the medicine becomes the sickness. That's the wrong way of doing it. And people can depend on meditation in the same way. I don't want to just uh, hit the Western or materialistic or chemistry-based approach. People can become attached to samadhi because it's sweet. You go up to the mountain, you learn how to do it and, and you just breathe in and out and one hour pass like that. Now. You may attain some great substance, fantastic awakening by that, but it's only you who has the benefit at that time. So how do you help other beings with that? How do you use that? Do you use your eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body and mind after that? So medicine can become the addiction as well with meditation. If we don't do this thing right, if we identify the method with the meditation itself, then this can happen. 
That's why I say have a balance, have some kind of balance between inside and outside and then inside and outside can become one. It doesn't make your boundaries disappear, but these boundaries become transparent. That any kind of mind experience which alters your notion of self, it alters your relationship with the body, it alters your relationship with other people, all right? So I wouldn't marginalize anything. Also, I wouldn't put into the center anything. What I would ask is a question, what is it that helps you right here, right now? With the further direction, with the far-reaching effect of our lives and deaths. You don't want to have a medicine which would make your sickness worse in the long run. And that's what we humans usually don't understand. And good medicine sometimes is bitter. Like the Buddha's teaching, sometimes it becomes dependent on the rendering. It can become structural, dry, boring, overwhelming, uh, somehow lacking, or overflowing, too emotional, too cognitive, too much, too much, or too little, too little. That's not in the teaching. It's in you. Yeah, I'm Brian. I'm a student here at Dongbuk University. I'm studying the Korean language in order to uh, do my PhD in Buddhist studies, actually. Uh, I'm also coming from a background in the West, and I'm interested in uh, cognitive behavioral therapy in particular. And I'm interested to know what your opinion is. Just a comparison, I suppose, between meditative, seated meditation and cognitive practice in what I mean by that is. Um, uh, yeah, what I mean by that is um, kind of a training. I think the, you focused on a, 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 a sense of I in Western psychology. And my experience with cognitive behavioral therapy is um, just a retraining or a rewiring of the way in which our habits, um, the way our thinking habits have developed. And so it's kind of a, a, a way to re reform the quote-unquote I. Um, in that way, I think it's very similar to Buddhism so far as it's just retraining yourself to think in a new way. Um, do you, what's, what's your opinion on a sense of self within the cognitive, cognitive behavior therapy. Well, like I said, I'm not a therapist, so yeah. I, I can only relate to that from a meditative point of view. Mm -hmm. So there's an equation. If you go very deep, you can make very big changes in cognitive, emotional, and other life. If you don't go deep enough, it remains on the surface. So how do you go deep enough? You have to understand deeply who you are and experience who you are, where your thoughts come from. In other words, if you get to the source of all your thoughts, then cognitive therapy becomes this easy. But if not, then you have to have this immense struggle to somehow overcome the habits of your client or your patient. But if the patient takes the energy to go into the habits and pull down the habits by his or her own effort, then it's, it's like a piece of cake. Yeah. And that's what the therapist has to do. First, build up enough trust that the person would listen to you. And second, build up enough faith that the person would start to practice and still come to you. And then the third, to use the result correctly. Remember the nuclear power metaphor, whether it's a bomb or a power plant? Uh, things can happen in therapy in that way too. And then come here. And these days I'm struggling with my personal crisis and thinking about my karma. And today um, I'm the way through the life that helps a lot. Thank you for your speech. You're welcome. Uh, have, have the mic a little longer because I think uh, you and I have something in common. We start something out of personal crises. It's no secret, I never made it a secret that I started Zen because I was in a personal crisis 22 years ago. So when your personality reaches a certain critical stage, a critical mass, a critical threshold, then some energy appears. If we don't handle that well, many bad things can happen. But if you know how to handle that energy, then it can sustain your practice. And that's why the Buddha said, without suffering, there is no enlightenment. 
So it doesn't mean we become masochist and we start to treasure our suffering and we make ourselves suffer more. No, we already have what we need. What I mean is relate to that crisis really well. And don't think that it's good or bad crisis. Rather, look at that, thank you. Look at that crisis from a generative point of view. That means, don't just describe your crisis, you can describe it in many ways. Sometimes you, can, you have to uh, alleviate the symptoms to a certain extent. But then use the power, the energy that appears in a crisis to get deeper and understand and attain what you truly are. Where the crisis came from. And disable that kind of duality sufficiently that it would not appear again, but do not take away dualities entirely so that you could exist again. It's, it's the same thing with any emotion. Too much love kills you. Too little love also kills you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So this is really important that you appreciate every single day of your life that you can use this body, that you can use your senses, that you can interact with people. And when you do that, you conquer your own hindrances like a breeze. So if you appreciate life, if you appreciate that you exist, if you value your body and mind, then these hindrances before meditation, they are gone so quick. You cannot even believe that. But if you have ideas, if you make good and bad, if you make difficult, oh, life is like that, that is like that, oh my God, you know, this kind of stuff. That kind of mind makes meditation also difficult. I also don't understand I. You can't. But you can attain. See, this not understanding doesn't mean blindness. It doesn't mean a lack of information. Okay? You cannot smell your nose. You cannot see your eyes. You cannot hear your ears. And you cannot understand your eye. Same thing. Rest with that. Now, if you can rest in that experience that you don't understand your eye, we call that don't know. And if you direct your question to that, what is this? Then you can attain I. But that means already no I. Okay? So if you understand, mistake. If you don't understand, also mistake. So experience. Okay? I have very confusing um, thoughts. It's like everything in a box, like a firework in a box, where everything sparkles. And um, I'm very confused. I have a lot of information, a lot of you know, comments from people. I, I feel just very confused. I want to have a peaceful way to find my true happiness. And that's why I'm here. Sylvia, so, just one brief comment. You have seen traffic jams in Hong Kong, right? <laughs> Terrible. Terrible. No one can do a ballet dance in a traffic jam. In other words, if your mind is overloaded with information, you cannot really think efficiently. So the very desire that you would have a lot of information and you would think efficiently, it contradicts. It contradicts with the basic function of your mind, with anyone's mind. So, if we have too much on our plate, we can't eat it because we can't digest it. Um, or your energy goes up very quickly, which we observe and we accept. But for you, it can become detrimental in critical situations because you cannot handle conflicts so well if your shock absorbers are not strong enough. I suggest you do some Tanjun practice or Tan Tian in uh, Chinese. And that strengthens your center here below your navel. In Sanskrit, it's called Muladhara Chakra, and it has a lot of names, but it has one function. This holds your energy together before it becomes emotion, speech, or thought, or sensory perception, or cognition. So if you look, all meditation positions are this or something very similar, focusing to this area. Okay? When you make that center stronger, your emotions and thoughts cannot control you. You can empty your mind without losing any information content. I know it's paradoxical, but it works like that. You do not lose information, but you attain a larger mind space. Like you ask the cars in the traffic jam, please move to the side because my friend wants to do a ballet dance. So if you can do this, if you can really do this, and anybody can, your mind becomes clear like space and clear like a mirror. 
and you remember what you need to remember momentarily, and when you don't need it, it goes back to the storehouse consciousness where it came from. Okay? So I suggest you continue coming and do this kind of practice. You'll see the difference in a couple of months. All right? <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you. And would you say that there is one of the best way, or should person like try all of them? Is there a best food in the world? <laughs> what you love most, that's best food. So meditation, you know, we have truckloads of styles and traditions and whatnot. Why? Because there are so many minds, there are so many kinds of people, there are so many kinds of likes and dislikes. So there's no meditation which is good or bad. There's no meditation which is high class or low class. The question is, what is it or which one is it that gets you to enlightenment? That's the only question. So deep inside we feel that, and you know what? Sometimes we try to escape as fast as we can because you know that it alters you. Your notion of self, your notion of the world will never be the same as before. And subconsciously, sometimes we try to escape even before we start practicing. Now, we don't even know that it happens. But somehow, we get attracted again and again and again to that kind of tradition to which deeply we belong to. And then we accept that. So it's not an easy deal. What I mean is, you have to be true to yourself and sincere to the bottom of your heart that you would find the meditation that you actually need. So, start shopping. All right? <laughs> Go out your walk. Hi, I'm Benka Mignon from um, other university, not in London. But I'm here for learning meditation, but I don't know what I should, what, what should I find from meditation? What can I want from meditation? Maybe you ask what you can forget. Forget? Yeah. If you do meditation, you can also forget things. Mm -hmm. yeah. Forget your ideas, mm -hmm. forget your prejudices, forget your traumas, forget a lot of things that you want to forget, but you cannot. Okay. All right? Okay. So if you cannot learn something, that's okay. Maybe you can forget things. <laughs> so I, I really appreciate, thank you, everybody's very kind contribution. And uh, I have to confess, this is not customary, but I have to confess that I knew that many people will have a hard time understanding the comparison between therapy and meditation because it's not customary to talk about that. It's not something that would be, you know, habitual in Korea. So I dare to put the level of understanding to a pretty high standard intellectually as well as experimentally inside. You can experiment with this. You can find some good, you know, result out of that. So I suggest that you listen to this online again and again if you're interested and also to more simple talks. And the last but not least, I would like to sincerely thank Kim Kanjanin for his kind invitation, okay. Subhu Sunim for making this uh, Son Center. I hope to see you guys in a month when hopefully in a more simple and straightforward way, but we again look at the characteristics of East and West in terms of mental traditions and very practical applications. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.